In this video, I will teach you all of the high yield information that you need to know about the intestinal nematodes. Most often, medical students, PA students, NP students, where, wherever you are in your training, most people have difficulty committing the high yield information about intestinal nematodes to their brain. And my theory for that is because a lot of the bacteria, a lot of the viruses, that information shows up on exams a lot more often. And so people spend so much time and effort memorizing bacteria and viruses that by the time they get to the helminthic infections and the helminthic pathogens, they really struggle to conceptualize this information and find a compartment in their brain to store all of this information. And so my goal in this video today is to, one, I'll go through all of the intestinal nematodes that you see on this slide, and I'll teach you in a traditional way what you need to know, what's high yield, what buzzwords you should know, how it's treated, the epidemiology, etc. But then at the very end of this video, I will give you my really cool mnemonic, which is, spoiler alert, it's actually a poem. It's a, an eight-sentence poem that you can say in about 15 to 20 seconds, which if you're really struggling to memorize things, you can recite it back on test day, and it might clue you into some of the really high yield bits of information that you need to know. So in this video, we'll start by talking about all of the intestinal nematodes that you see on this slide. Enterobius vermicularis, Ascaris lumbricoides, Strongyloides stercoralis, Ankylostoma duodenale, Necator americanus, Trichinella spiralis, and Trichuris trichuria. Let's start with a brief overview just to establish and create a compartment or a category for what we're talking about. So all of the intestinal nematodes are known as helminthic organisms, which is a scientific way of saying that these are parasitic worms. Almost all of these worms are tubular. They have tubular digestive systems with openings at both ends. And as you'll see, the majority reside in the topsoil. And so oftentimes, the way that humans get infected with these helminthic intestinal nematodes is we come in contact with soil that has some trace of the organism. Now, the important thing to know about the intestinal nematodes is that the way that the human immune system fights them off is by utilizing eosinophils. And on your exam, you should understand that this could involve a type 1 or a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Type 1 involving neutralization with histamine and leukotrienes, and type 2 involving eosinophilic attachment via IgE. Not too much to know there, but just keep in the back of your mind that if you're taking your exam and you get a lab printout with a high level of eosinophils, you want to potentially associate that with fending off a helminthic organism or a helminthic infection. Let's get started with Enterobius vermicularis. So it's the ingestion of the pinworm eggs that causes the infection. So we're talking about fecal oral transmission here. The big buzzword and the big clinical symptom that you need to keep in the back of your mind is perianal puritis. In other words, itching around the anal opening. What happens here is that when the human who's infected with enterobius goes to sleep, at night, the adult female worm in the intestine will migrate to the anal opening. And there, they will deposit thousands of eggs. So from the human's perspective, what that feels like is itching in the perianal area. And so the way that this is diagnosed is with the cellophane tape test. And literally what happens is a piece of tape is placed over the anal opening. And in the morning, that piece of tape is examined. And if there are eggs seen on that piece of cellophane tape, that's a positive tape test, which is to say we know that an adult female worm must have laid eggs on that piece of tape at night. And that would be how Enterobius vermicularis is diagnosed. The treatment is going to be bendazoles. So the big thing that you want to take away from this slide for the purposes of exams is perianal puritis diagnosed by the cellophane tape test. That is enterobius. Ascaris lumbricoides, you want to associate this with obstruction of tubular structures. 
And by tubular structures, I mean areas that stem from different organs with material passing through. So we're talking about things like pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas due to obstruction of the tubular lumen that leaves the pancreas. Cholecystitis due to inflammation of the gallbladder because of obstruction of the tubular lumen that leaves the gallbladder, etc., etc. So Ascaris lumbricoides think obstruction of any kind of lumen. This can also cause pneumonitis if the eggs migrate to the lungs. And of course, expect to see eosinophilia like, to, like I talked about in the overview slide. Transmission here, fecal oral, and diagnosis is going to be made from the stool exam for ova and parasites. So literally, we will be looking at the feces, looking at the stool, and trying to determine if there are ova and parasites in the stool. This is also treated with bendazoles. So the big takeaway for Ascaris lumbricoides is obstruction of tubular structure. So you can get inflammation of various organs like the pancreas, like the gallbladder. You can get a small bowel obstruction because the lumens that leave or are part of inherently those organs get obstructed and that causes inflammation. That is Ascaris lumbricoides. Now let's move on to Strongyloides stercoralis. So as I talked about in the overview slide, a lot of the infection of intestinal nematodes is due to contaminated soil. And so here is an example of transcutaneous infection. So the larvae are in fecal contaminated soil. And when a human walks on top of that fecal contaminated soil, the larvae will penetrate the skin and cause infection. So the big things you want to look out for here with strongyloides are GI symptoms and respiratory symptoms. Now, the GI symptoms tend to be nonspecific, and there's no individual symptom you necessarily need to memorize. Same for the respiratory symptoms. It's going to be things like cough. Basically, if you see somebody struggling with diarrhea, abdominal pain, or cough and some systemic symptoms, that's sort of non-specifically referring to GI and respiratory symptoms, so you would want to think about strongyloides. There's no pathognomonic buzzword here that you necessarily need to know. The one thing that I would point out, and it's not necessarily attributable or pathognomonic just to strongyloides, is something called Loeffler syndrome, which is, basic, which is basically eosinophilic pneumonia. This can also cause a super infection. So what I'm hinting at here is that with strongyloides stercoralis, there's no clinical symptom that I want you to necessarily memorize, more so just understand that the route of infection is transcutaneous due to fecal contaminated soil. Some risk factors for strongyloides that could help you if you're really struggling on your exam are immunosuppressed patients, patients with HIV, patients with HTLV1, and patients with a history of alcoholism. These are all risk factors. So if you're really gunning for a perfect score, then perhaps you memorize these, but otherwise I wouldn't concern yourself too much with that information. Because the infection is transcutaneous and it comes through the soil, there are also occupational risk factors. So anybody who farms, mines, or does general field work are more likely to step on fecal contaminated soil and therefore get the infection. And the treatment here is going to be bendazoles. And if you can't use bendazoles, you can use ivermectin. So strongyloides, when you're memorizing this for your exam, I would really just focus on the transcutaneous piece. Know that anybody who works in soil is more likely to get it. Otherwise, I wouldn't concern yourself too much with any other buzzwords. Now we'll move on to ankylostoma duodenale and necator americanus. So just like we just talked about, these two are an example of transcutaneous infection where fecal contaminated soil comes in contact with human skin and then the infection penetrates the skin and that is the way that it gets into the human. The way that this works is that it's an ascending infection. So it works its way up because most people get it first in their skin, usually in their feet, but not always. It works its way up, and eventually it makes its way to the respiratory tree. Then the human will cough, bringing it up at the junction of the trachea and the esophagus. The patient or the human will swallow, 
and then that puts the infection into the GI system, causing the systemic manifestations. So there are two things that you want to look out for with both Ankylostoma duodenale and Necator americanus. One is called cutaneous larva migrans, which is a really fancy way of saying an itchy snake-like rash. And specifically, that rash is going to be where the skin contacts the soil. So if on your exam you see an image of a snake-like, which is serpiginous, rash that's a little bit erupted, meaning that some parts of it are raised, and in the vignette they tell you it's puritic or itchy, that is screaming at you that it's an intestinal nematode and you want to think about ankylostoma or americanus. The other thing to keep in mind is anemia and protein loss. So because again this is an ascending infection, when it makes its way to the intestinal phase, once it's in the GI system, these worms, the adult worms, literally attach to the intestinal capillaries and cause them to rupture. And when we rupture capillaries, that means we have problems absorbing things, so we see protein loss, and it means that we have problem regulating hemoglobin because blood flow is affected, and therefore we have anemia. So anemia and protein loss are because the adult worms latch onto and bite the intestinal capillaries. Treatment here, bendazoles. If you can't use bendazoles, pyrantal pamoate. So the bottom line here for ankylostoma and americanus, both are grouped together, you want to know two things. One, the itchy, snake-like, slightly erupted rash where the soil that's infected or contaminated, I should say, meets the skin. And two, anemia and protein loss because of worms literally biting onto and rupturing the intestinal capillaries. That is Ankylostoma duodenale and Necator americanus. Now let's move on to Trichinella spiralis. This is caused by consuming raw or undercooked pork. It can be from some other meats and other game, but generally on your exam on USMLE or Comlex, it's going to be pork. The infection occurs in two phases. There's the enteric phase and there's the systemic phase. The enteric phase is caused by pepsin and hydrochloric acid causing the release of the larvae. Then there's the systemic phase where the larvae will travel through the lymphatics, through the blood, and ultimately find its way into some muscle tissue. That muscle tissue will either be in the myocardium, the brain, or the skeletal muscle. And the reason that it's going to end up in the heart, the brain, or the skeletal muscle is because those organs or those areas have an extremely high oxygen content that trichinella needs to survive. So what you're going to see on your exam clinically are non-specific GI symptoms, but the big one and the one that you absolutely need to know or memorize is myalgias because this is going to find its way to muscle tissue. Muscle equals myalgia, muscle cramps. You absolutely need to know that. You can get some nonspecific symptoms like fever, chills, fatigue, but another big one is periorbital edema. So if you're looking at this slide and you're like, dude, just tell me what I should memorize. My answer is muscle tissue, myalgia, and periorbital edema. If you can keep those three things associated with trichinella spiralis in your brain, you're golden. So again, I'll say it one more time because I'm hammering it into your neurons. Trichinella spiralis, think myocardium, brain, and skeletal muscle. Those are all tissues with very high oxygen content. Because trichinella is going to muscle, you're going to see myalgia. Also, back of your mind, periorbital edema. Treatment for trichinella, bendazoles. And that's it. So let's just move on. Remember, muscles, myalgias, edema. Now we'll talk about Trichurius trichuria. It's a pretty curious name, no pun intended. So this is fecal oral transmission, most often in warm, humid, and hot climates. Two things you wanna look at on your exam for Trichurius trichuria, rectal bleeding and rectal prolapse. Rectal bleeding and rectal prolapse. 
especially in children, rectal prolapse. That's the big buzzword here. If you see rectal prolapse as it relates to a nematode, the answer is trichurious trichuria, and you're done. You can see some other GI symptoms like nocturnal passage of stools, painful diarrhea, painful defecation, and mucousy stools, but on your exam, they're going to give you rectal prolapse if they want you to pick trichurious trichuria. If things are really severe, you can see anemia, pallor, malnutrition, and failure to thrive, but again, they're gonna give you rectal prolapse, so that's what you wanna know. Treatment is bendazoles. So if you have made it through the roughly 15, 20 minutes, however long that information took me to deliver to you, and you're like, I'm sorry, I, I just can't memorize that, I need a mnemonic, here is my nematode poem. So I'm gonna do this in my best Shakespeare voice, um, because I think that if you can't find the brain space, you can just memorize this poem. What you'll notice here is that it is one nematode per line of the poem, the nematode is highlighted in red, and the key buzzword or key symptom that you need to associate with the nematode is highlighted in blue in the same line. So here we go. <clears throat> Enter eggs in the anus will make it itchy. Pork makes you spiral, the muscle gets glitchy. Strong from the soil causes poops and coughs. The ankle of America makes capillaries slough. Tricurious indeed, the prolapse protrudes then. Lumber in the tubes, this will occlude them. The nematode poem, that is all. Treat all of these worms with bendazoles. And I want you to notice that we're talking about the intestinal nematodes and line by line, you can associate the words in red with the corresponding nematode. So for example, enter eggs in the anus will make it itchy. Enter for enterobius eggs in the anus will make it itchy, that's helping you remember that the key buzzword or the key association is perianal puritis. And so go through my poem and memorize this if you want to, because it gives you the one key buzzword that I think you should memorize. So one more time for everybody at home, enter eggs in the anus will make it itchy. Pork makes you spiral, the muscle gets glitchy. Strong from the soil causes poops and coughs. The ankle of America makes capillaries slough. Tricurious indeed, the prolapse protrudes then. Lumber in the tubes, this will occlude them. The nematode poem, that is all. Treat all of these worms with bendazoles. Good luck.